welcome to the Bigfoot Roundtable. Hey there. <laughs> hey. So, hey. How's everybody tonight? Good, Good? I guess. Good. <laughs> Middle of the week? Yeah. Just through the week. So, <laughs> my first question is, did everybody survive the worst apocalypse ever <laughs> yesterday? I'm here to say I did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Even though the eclipse was uh, came on by the uh, climate change, yeah, yeah, that's what I heard. So, yeah, uh, welcome everybody in the chat. We got a whole long list here. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. So tonight, I wanted to bring up the fact we're gonna. Now, this is something that uh, M.K. Davis actually did a little video a couple of weeks ago about, and it was it was a little short little video he did, and it triggered something in my brain, and it's something that's been going on with Bigfooting forever. Uh, we're going to be talking about the bar, the evidence bar, and is Bigfoot raising the evidence bar on us every time we find something? It doesn't seem to work. Uh, so... That's what I wanted to talk about tonight, and we're going to go through everybody's. I've got some questions here that we're going to try to cover, but for, off the bat, let's go down our panel list here. We'll start with Tobe. What is the most compelling evidence that supports the existence of Bigfoot, in your opinion? Hmm. I would say that'd be collaborative locations with witness testimony on place names. So what I mean by that is places that are on a map that sound as though they're mysterious or spooky generally have those names made by locals, indigenous people. Um, and those seem to have consistent sighting reports, not just Bigfoot names, but names like Spirit Ridge, Devil Mountain, Booger Hill. Um, when you have, <laughs> yeah, when you have consistent reports, and I think we can probably all attest to going to a location that has a weird name and, you know, having a sighting, seeing something, have rocks thrown. Um, to me, that's really, um, that's how it, it all started for, for me as far as like, could that work? Um, and so it did. And I think consistently it has. So I think that's probably the best the best first step as far as consistency to what people are saying exists out there. Does that cool. make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. Nikki, what's, what's your opinion? I think um, the encounters are definitely up there. You know, th those are one of my top I'm finding that wasn't always the case, but I'm finding that people who have, have had these encounters and the way they express it, not all are the same, you know, not all seem credible or, or, you know, what have you, but there are a lot out there that just, they encompass um, all of it, you know, the whole ticket, they encompass where they were, what they were doing, what happened. They weren't even looking for Bigfoot. They were just out having a great time and they 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 seem credible to me. And those type of encounters I hold at a very high level, you know. I mean, of course those can get knocked down if you go and you find out that well they lied about where they were, they weren't you know, there wasn't other people who saw the the Bigfoot in the area. There there could be a lot of what ifs with that. But I hold that higher than footprints. I hold that higher than video and photo evidence right now because so much of that can just be, I don't know, really put in a bad light, you know, because we weren't there. We weren't there to witness what was going on. So, you know, I have to agree with Tobe on that, that there's some things out there that when people give you their heartfelt encounter story, who are we to say they didn't have that? Mm -hmm. So for me right now, that's where it's at. 
you know, and maybe when I more boots on the ground, then that. <laughs> All right, Joe, what do you think? I agree with them, but the, the tracks that I've found, I mean, no hoax is going to go out there where I found them tracks because a hoax is going to try to put a footprint where they're easily found. There's a lot of fakes out there. I've seen probably a dozen pictures of fake footprints since, since Sunday. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, Whoa. but the but the people that say that they've seen one, I think that's. I mean, you can pretty much tell when they're joking around or BSing you. But when you get somebody and they're like their hair stand up on their arm and stuff, or you know, the eyes start watering up and they experience something that you know that you just can't make up. I think that's pretty credible. Yeah, it is. I mean, and I would have to go along with all you guys. It's mostly the reports. Um, you know, I've I've had people like, especially when we're at events, they'll walk by my booth three or four times and give me the old side eye, waiting for nobody to be in there, nobody to be next to me, nobody <laughs> else in the booth with me, and then they'll come up and and fill me out and then tell me their story. Those are the ones that are very credible. Uh, but as far as evidence goes, I mean, eyewitness reports, uh, to me are, are very, they're, they're, I don't know, they're not tangible evidence really, to be honest with you, but for me, they're, they're pins and maps. Um, definitely. Um, that's what I use to, to go out and do research is all the reports that we get, uh, you know, they're uh, look for dates and times and in locations, and know what month this area is hot and what month that area is hot and stuff like that. I can do that with all the reports, um, but uh, but as far as tangible evidence goes, I mean, will that stand up in court? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, not nowadays. Not nowadays. <laughs> it won't. Right. You're freezing up periodically, Scott. Either that or you have a really interesting resting squatch face. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there he goes. Okay. He's a brilliant mime. Let's all do it. Yeah, brilliant mime. <laughs> okay, so we're having solar for uh, we're using uh, we're using our Starlink right now and there's a solar it's it's like some kind of solar extreme thing going on right now. Okay. It's causing problems with the satellite. Uh, so if I lock up, it'll just take a second. I'll be back. <laughs> so, <laughs> so tracks, uh, let's move to those. Are they evidence? Tangible no evidence? I think so. I mean, the tracks, um, they have eDNA in them. And with the use of LiDAR, with the new iPhone in particular, I don't know if anybody's had a chance to go look at a track even, not just a Bigfoot track, just go look at any track with a LiDAR. It's amazing. In fact, you can take a photo and then turn it into a 3D LiDAR with a program, so you don't even need LiDAR. Mm -hmm. You almost don't even need plaster. I mean, if you can do a sample of eDNA, right, record yourself scooping up the ground, in the track or the handprint or whatever, the place where you think it was sitting, and you can come back with something um, that is tantamount to being undocumented or not in the data set with a scan and maybe even a plaster impression or hydrocal, and then you can follow that in concert to a sighting or secondary evidence or a nest or whatever. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like my buddy, John Clinton, who lives in Rainbow, Oregon. Um, how, how, if John's watching, how you doing? Um, he, he followed a trackway that was, I think he said the tracks were over 20 inches and they were over six feet apart. This was in Northern California. And that's all he had, right? It was just the interest to see if this was a hoax or how this happened. 
he ended up five feet away from a Sasquatch, um, you know, face to face. And he'll never forget it. And so, I mean, they're worth following up on, even if they're a hoax. You know, it takes a long time to figure out if you have a hoax on your hand um, and people vacillate. But I always say, when in doubt, follow it, track it, cast it, whatever. Right. Oh, absolutely. I always cast it. Cast first and ask mm -hmm. questions later. Yeah, uh, I meant, um, as far as that LIDAR stuff goes, or the, the 3D scanning, uh, that's what I just started doing. Um, I actually tested it out. Um, the pad, you know, and, and made a print. And then I scanned it, and then I used a 3D printer to print it out, and I can't tell the difference <laughs> between the cast and the 3D printed. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Wait, so, so you took a 3D scanner, and then you digitally made a polymer plastic version of it? Yeah. Oh, that's so incredible. I don't know anybody who's done that. That's incredible. <laughs> okay. I think that's so cool. Do you have, you have that cast? I do. I don't have it with me. It's out okay. In, in, but um, yeah, I have it. That's incredible. So could you do that with anything? I mean, yeah, anything that is leaving an impression would right. you could cast a, a plastic version of it. Yes. Wow. Okay. That's incredible. Which, makes, which also makes really good footprints that are hard that I could strap on my shoes and fake prints with. Oh. Which is kind of stupid. <laughs> But that's what we need to think about, right? Yeah. Is when you evolve your science, there's more ways for the not so credible out mm -hmm. there to to use against us. You know, yeah. it's it's a kind of two way street there yeah. because you're always yeah. going to have these motivations. And everybody's got different motivations. Some's going to be that money trail thing. Some's going to be more of a scientific pursuit. Some is a more paranormal or, as Tobe would say, a normal pursuit. <laughs> you know, he, <laughs> anyway, um, we everybody has their own journey through the, through here. So some are going to hold footprints as the beat all thing. That's the number one thing that shows them these things are real, you know, and that's okay, you know, but it just depends what alley you're going down at that time. You know, I, I'm a little bit skeptical on prints unless there's a sighting that's with it. Yeah. You know, if, you know, like the Patterson Gimlin, they've had prints along with the sighting, along with video, along with all this other stuff, which mm -hmm. put it on a higher level for me. But that's one um, reason why I the picture of track. I said, I'm not sure I didn't see a Bigfoot do that, but it looks like a footprint. But I always make sure I say, I don't know if a Bigfoot did that or not. Yeah, they're all alleged. They're they're all alleged unless you're actually videotaping it, doing it, you know. Uh -huh. Which is one oh. thing I found um, Thomas Steenberg would always, he never failed to say alleged or possible or, you know, he never stated anything was fact. It's, you know, all speculative. Which was okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I have, well, I had my sighting. I took my photo, but I also have the footprints from where they were standing too. So I have that too for my sighting. Um, we have, you know, I have a picture of the two Bigfoot and I have 16 inch tracks and nine inch tracks next to them. Um, mm -hmm. So I have all those. Uh, but nobody believes me, you know, <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's that, you know, and that's something I run into. And that was going to be uh, one of the next questions is um, I've had guys. Now we do a lot of shows. We do a lot of sportsman shows and, and just non Bigfoot things that people come in and tell me their Bigfoot stories. Um, but we also have the guys that walk into the thing I've been hunting my whole life, you know, <laughs> I've been running <laughs> dogs on bears, you know, since I was a kid, uh, that sort of stuff. And, you know, I, I've had, 
a gentleman say, well, how come you ain't got any evidence? And I'll turn around and look at this two tables full of footprint casts that I have sitting there, you know, and say, what's all that? And he goes, ah, they're all faked, <laughs> you know, <laughs> every single one of them, you know. So, so what do we do about this skepticism? Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, the, right. it, it, yeah. One of the things well, that what you can do about it, you could you could have one in a cage at one of your shows, and somebody <laughs> still going to say it's not for, not real. <laughs> yeah, somebody's going to say it's not real. Yeah, but those skeptics, you know, if they have a sighting, um, they turn into the best witnesses really the people that really fight it um they argue the best points they're the most passionate i mean you've seen it scott um mm -hmm. these bow hunters that show up guys that guys that literally walk in at four in the morning five or six miles maybe longer by themselves they'll set up a tree stand these these warriors right of the woods they don't care who knows what they're doing they do it in the dark they're they're hunters right they're real bushmen and when those guys turn into witnesses i just I mean, that's my favorite story is those guys right like and they're really reticent they're not coming forward unless they i trust you right they're super they'd stand offish um but yeah. that's we got to wait for those guys to come forward because they're they're the best they're the best yeah i heard a, i heard a guy say the other day or read a guy say the other day that how come hunters never report bigfoot saying i said well you ain't done your homework mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah there's hunters all the time saying that they they couldn't shoot it because they thought it was a uh, human right mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Sharon from Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> I right. thought I'd give her a shout out. So, hi, Sharon. Okay, there we go. Awesome. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I do these sportsman shows, and there's actually a, a, there's a guy who's at, who is one of the guest speakers at these sportsman shows, who's one of these outfitters who takes guys out hunting and fishing and, and stuff like that. And uh, he, he took me aside one, one one year we were doing these uh, we've done these shows for four years now or three years i think in a row and uh and this one guy took me aside and uh told me this really cool story about what happened to him and some guy that he had from michigan that came out here to oregon to that he took out hunting and uh it ended up with a guy from michigan running back to the truck and then he had to chase him back to the truck and then the guy was sitting in the truck saying, I'm not hunting in Oregon ever yeah. again because of what he just saw, you know, but he told me this great story, but he won't let me share it. He won't let me videotape him. He won't let me tell you who he is or anything like that because I probably will hurt right. his business. But, um, but for him to take me behind the curtain and tell me the story, that's like Tobe said, that's one of the most credible ones that for me. Yeah. Anyway. The, so we were in meddling falls for two nights, two days last weekend and this guy walked in late to this conference um he he just came in off the street now medellin is where they shot the postman with kevin costner right like super remote northern washington canadian border nothing but granite you know beautiful fly fishing territory and forest and bigfoot country so this guy i was the only one there right so i had i showed him as much as i could because i could tell he was a hunter that was deep in the bush and had a, had an experience on a game cam. But because I opened up this other channel of, you know, saying, Hey, do you want to hear the sounds? Have you heard them? What do they sound like to you? Do you want to hear more sounds? Like maybe we could match it. Maybe you could listen to the Moorhead sounds. Mm -hmm. um, and by the end of it, right? Like he felt comfortable enough to say, why do I have missing time? Now, this was not, this was a salt of the earth guy, but I opened up this other Pandora's box to this world, right? Where Sasquatch exists. We, we know that from what Matt Moneymaker just broke on the BFRO, that the, the tide is turning here for these full conversations to exist of not just the sightings, 
because these expert, these expert witnesses are ready not only to talk about their Bigfoot stuff, but stuff like orbs and missing time and uh, disappearing tracks and all this other stuff. So, you know, I count that as just as important evidence. A lot of these guys are completely messed up at, from the Bigfoot stuff, but they're even more messed up because they can't tell the full story. You know what I mean? Like they're, they've been stifled with this hidden event. And um, there's just a small percentage of us ready to hear the crazier stuff. But I think we at least need to entertain it because it's not going away. And um, that's it's a solid case for understanding what we're dealing with as far as it being the whole body of evidence. So the tracks are one thing. The sounds are another. But this peripheral issue here, it's the leading edge. It's why Matt Moneymaker has a week of woo coming out right now because I mean, this is the BFRO, right? This You do not talk about this unless it's in flats. You don't preach it. You don't discuss it. And now it's going to be their new normal. They have no place to anchor up except taking the entire report, which is the entire weirdness of Sasquatch. Wow. Nikki, what's your thought on that? <laughs> yeah, Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I mean, you hear it all the time that that same uh, focus on hunters and they have seen them, but it's a taboo. They're not going to come out and risk being laughed at by their buddies, you know, on what they saw. And I bet you there's a lot out there who saw something and didn't say a word to any of their group that were out there. Mm -hmm. And they will go to the grave with that, you know, and some it'll disturb them so much. They won't ever go back into the woods again. And some become big footers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> That triggers them to want to go out and see what's out there. So it's it's a fascination, and we all have that draw. Either way you look at it, um, we need it all. Even the shitty pictures, the shitty videos, the blurry whatever, we need it all, right? Because maybe one day all that shit's going to really make a difference, all of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I just don't think a lot of it should go out into the internet. You, know? <laughs> you should like keep it in your, in your own little files until the time comes when you have something that is so unbelievable that you, you know, then you start to reach out and, and start sharing and and pulling in people who you trust to go through your evidence with you. I think a lot of people put stuff out there before they really should. I was watching a uh, Mountain Beast Mysteries the other day, and Justin was talking about a uh, a story like I think it's from 1968. There was two hunters that went this out. Is the killing me. This is killing me. Okay. <laughs> it's like our, our Bigfoot group, you know, Squatch America, our motto is we investigate then explain. We don't explain then investigated. So, um, you know, it's great to investigate it. I mean, but we can't, uh, unless you investigate it, you really don't have a right to talk about it, basically, is what I, I feel. Mm. So, uh, man, I just, I'm having stuff pop up all over my computers being crazy. Um, so I'm going to play a little quick ad real quick before we go any further. And then I got a question after that. And we're going to talk about something that's coming up for us. Here. Hello, Bigfoot enthusiasts. Scott here from Squatch America. And I'm here today, a uh, rainy day on Mount Hood. Is there any other day on Mount Hood? <laughs> anyway. I got something very exciting to talk to you about. Uh, Squatch America and the Bigfoot Roundtable folks are actually sponsoring a Bigfoot Science Fair. 
Yeah, it's going to run from April through November. We need you to get your greatest Bigfoot evidence gathering idea together and send it to squatchamerica at gmail.com. And the Bigfoot Roundtable will be reviewing them as they come in. And then at the end of November, the beginning of October, in our October episode of the Bigfoot Roundtable, we will announce the winners, the top three places, will be prizes. So if you want to join the science fair, uh, check out the information on the screen right here. And all you have to do is create a video of your idea and then submit it to squatchamerica at gmail.com. Just email us a link or email the video and we will be reviewing it on the Bigfoot Roundtable. Right, guys how do you feel like being the feel like that you're going to be the shark tank oh. of the bigfoot research world i'll be more cuban <laughs> <laughs> i'll be the bitchy one from qfc <laughs> <There you go>. <laughs> <laughs> oh man it's gonna be good it's gonna be I know of a lot of people who should already be thinking about turning something in. Yeah. I I can name probably two or three people right now that have something very intriguing that they do while they're out squatching. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> we'll it. see. <laughs> yeah so that's going to be fun um you know i'm always trying to come up with new and interesting different ideas you know uh we've got one in the works i mean i don't count in this <laughs> but uh we we just uh i just put together a little we call it project pond scum <laughs> and what i'm doing is uh uh, taking the 360 degrees of trail cameras that don't use infrared that trigger by just motion uh, so they're not giving off any light or anything. And we're floating them on ponds, little ponds up in the woods and let them sit there on the water and see what comes to the water um, kind of deal. Mm -hmm. So that's something we're, I'm working on right now. Um, but will any of these new ideas gather evidence that will make the world go, okay, you know, <laughs> which is which is the biggest problem. So here's the next question. How does popular culture and media portrayal of Bigfoot influence public perception of the search for the evidence? Hmm. What? Say that one more time for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm back. <laughs> say, say it again, Scott. Okay. <clears throat> I would say, how does... Uh, popular culture and media portrayal of Bigfoot influence uh, public perception and our search for evidence. Well, it makes it a joke. Like, um, you know, we're undoing the word Bigfoot, first of all. It's kind of the first misstep we've made because now it's just this goofy thing that has a large appendage. It could have been big anything. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, Bigfoot, big what else? So it's just like, yeah. it seemed like a big mistake. And, you know, Sasquatch is so much more beautiful, you know, it, it reaches to the Native Americans and uh, the First Nations. And I don't know, just seeing, I get it. I mean, like I have bumper stickers and stuff here on my cork board. And, but I think we've really made a misstep by Disneyfying the phenomena. And we're constantly trying to explain that this is something real first of all and that there's more than one 
like this is the whole thing is right like they see the pg film and they don't a know that it's a female they don't seem to ever know that's weird to me that they don't know that's a female and they think there's only one right or they think it's only harry and the henderson and it just i don't know it's kind of tiresome don't you think like it doesn't help yeah every time you see somebody in the media talking about it, they're laughing right I was thinking, well, do you think there's a Bigfoot out there? <laughs> like, right. Have you found one yet? I've heard that a million times. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's one of the questions I get all the time at these festivals. Oh. Hey, have you found one yet? Yeah. And I look I at know. him straight in the eye and go, yes. <laughs> and they kind of look shocked at me like, what? Yeah. <laughs> right. That it, we have a culture that immediately wants to demonize Bigfoot. Most of the Bigfoot movies or anything aside from uh, Harry mm -hmm. were all these evil looking, grotesque Bigfoot out to eat your face off, you know? And that's where society takes it, where people away from Bigfoot, okay? Remember, we're a small part of this whole, you know, picture. The rest of the you know community uh, world U.S. whatever that's what they get. That's what um, mm -hmm. their first encounter is with exists. You know that's what Bigfoot looks like. Mm -hmm. Is is that? I wonder if Raptor Crazy is talking about us. So it's not like you guys aren't doing an expedition to go really really deep in the woods to try to find one. I know he ain't talking about me. <laughs> He's got, I know. talking you about just himself. picked off the wrong cowboy there, Raptor. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This guy's spurs. Have you seen him? They're bigger <laughs> than a windmill. A <laughs> I forget Nikki's been up there. And where'd you go that last trip with Brent and everybody? He was way the heck up there, yeah. there too. Mount St. <laughs> Helens, yeah. Mm -hmm. Toby, you've been out. You've been down deep in the woods, so I don't know if he must not be. Oh, he yeah. must be I have all the time, but I've never done it squatching. You know, I've always just done that out there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of different when your mindset mm -hmm. has Bigfoot on the brain and you're, mm -hmm. you know, out there with a whole different mentality of what you're out there for. So, and how, how many bodies are happening by hikers going through jogging trails? Mm -hmm. Exactly. About that, just walk across the trail in front of you. But you this is like one of the yeah. misnomers too that you need to go deep in the woods. Like the best Bigfoot evidence that I've seen collected by people is not more than a couple miles from their house, um, or too far from a park, or even that far from a freeway or power lines. Like it seems like the deeper you go, the more aggressive. First of all. And, and it's going to be brief, um, but these prolonged experiences that happen more than once seem to happen close to zip codes of people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I don't know, the Raptor, I think that's maybe, maybe one way to do it, and maybe it works for you. I haven't seen that work here in Oregon, Washington. Yeah. Raptor, he's on Watch America's channel. I'm re um, channeling it onto my my um, channel as well. So okay. you're on my channel and he's on the other channel because okay. he can't get on my channel. He's blocked. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> gotcha. Oh my so, God. Yeah. So actually, believe it or not, um, a lot of the footprints and stuff that we find uh, power lines, that's that's a Bigfoot highway in the woods. Uh, mm -hmm. We do a lot of research following power lines, mm -hmm. and uh, but something Nikki said earlier is 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 there is this danger that we have all these videos like Killer Bigfoot, you know, you know, <laughs> the cannibal yeah. bush, all that stuff. But believe it or not, that's kind of been a thing for a long time. What I have here is a list of names of Bigfoot from Native American tribes. Mm -hmm. All right. The red ones mean bad things. The black ones mean good, good ones. So 
this has been going on for a long time. Even back in the Native American uh, era, there's they're kind of split 50-50 whether they're good or bad. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't think that, that whole thing of Bigfoot's bad has been around for a lot longer than most people think. Yeah. It could be, well, yeah. With the movies, they're trying to sell, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it is actually that money thing. So, you know, yeah. um, I want to see a scary movie. They want to see blood and guts and, you know, and all that good stuff. They the will be scared. The right. human hunt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have this other question. <laughs> Why why do you think mainstream science hasn't jumped on this yet? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'll, I'll I'll start off this one. Mm -hmm. Uh a lot of stuff now you know, I have worked with colleges, you know, on archaeological digs and stuff being an anthropologist and uh anything that's kind of fringe like Bigfoot, UFOs, that sort of thing. I have found stuff that would shock you to death, Tobe. <laughs> I found pictographs of rockets being launched and stuff uh, from Native Americans. You know, in my in my opinion, um, but we weren't allowed to talk about it because the the college will lose funding if you do. I think that's one of the bigger things that the colleges. And I think it's getting better, but. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, they, they're strictly, you know, will lose funding for stuff. And then another thing, uh, most of the bigger like anthropological finds in history have been naysayed for years by everybody in the mainstream uh, just because they didn't find it. Mm. That sort of thing. So, I mean, you're right, Scott. Like I don't have the luxury of financing being taken away from me for my personal opinion. But I could see if you're not a tenured professor, if you're on some board, if you have investors that have nervous looks, um, you better have what we call FU money because mm -hmm. that is your only way for total freedom. I mean, we see the likes of Elon Musk, um, you know, on a podium saying things that we could only dream of saying, right? And here's a guy that has that kind of money that can speak freely, but there's like there's two separate books of knowledge here. Like you're saying, you have pictographs with rockets on it. Well, that's hidden knowledge that isn't going to be divulged to the public sector. It's part of the private sector. I think there's this whole world of like private science, right? Like something that happened maybe in the 1930s that they discovered and they kept to themselves along with all the other you know, relics and information. And then they gave us this other version of science that we can talk about that's shared, that's dumbed down, that's not as useful, that's controlled. Um, but there's this whole world of like free energy, free thought that they have advanced knowledge of. And um, Bigfoot seems to be a part of that world for whatever reason, because I think there's really strange attributes to these things that are mimicking free energy like ufos and they're tapping into all sorts of stuff uh and i think that's probably part of this hidden world that we can't know about because you know if they fr if we free our minds to know about this stuff then we're dangerous we we're on an equal playing field with the military industrial complex and the powers that be and the I just don't trust the government. I honestly think that they're more often not here to do us harm. And that's not popular for a lot of people. I don't know why, but when it comes to like knowledge is power, they don't want you to have power. So why would they want you to have knowledge? So it's real. We know it's real and they're hiding it. I mean, we know that they're hiding it. They have to know. They know they're hiding it. That's why they're making it seem so stupid with names like Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> there you go. That's a good point. <clears throat> Come on, chime in there, Nikki. Are they? Are, <laughs> is the government hiding it? Is, is this? Is this a, a government conspiracy? No, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm kind of opposite end of of, of that. 
part is that I don't think it's a government conspiracy and I don't think they would waste all that time to hide something like that. And because there's just so many pieces to government, so many pieces of the puzzle that would have to be read in that I just, I can't, I have a real hard time thinking that they are definitely not pursuing it, you know, uh, definitely not making it an issue or trying to research it. So, but I just don't see the evidence either way. You know, it's just, it's just another factor out there that lingers. And uh, I personally don't like to, do, I don't even really like to speculate about it because it won't get us anywhere. It's not, you know, getting us further down the road. So if they're going to, if, if they are hiding all this from us, nothing's going to change, right? They're going to continue uh, with that um, way of misleading us. So that'll right. never change. We need to do something else. And the researchers who are out there every day, somebody's going to somebody's gonna crack this. Somebody's going to do it. And it's going to be a matter of being in the right time, at the right place, and it's going to happen. You know, that's what I think. There I, don't care, I don't care what the government thinks. <laughs> what <they're doing. laughs> Back in 2009, there was a guy um, in uh, Coos Bay, Oregon, near Elkton, Oregon. And his name was Don. And Don was working for the um, BLM out of uh, Benita, Oregon. So he told me this incredible encounter while he was on the job at six in the morning tagging trees. He um, had to write a report, turned it into the field office based upon a Sasquatch that he saw. He thought it was picking mushrooms off on the skid road. And he had to write everything down. If he saw a cougar, if he saw got stung by a hornet, whatever. So he had to write down. He saw a big shaggy thing walking on two legs on the skid road, turned in the report and um you know, the boss, uh, I can't remember what his boss's exact words were, but when he went home that day, the secretary handed him a map and the secretaries have been keeping track from seaside all the way down to gold beach, of Bigfoot reports, right? This is what's in the first part of a flash of beauty. But I saw this map, like when Autumn Williams was doing her thing out in Elkton with me back in 2010, he gave me the map, like it's an official BLM map of the reports it had a key code on it um and the secretaries have been keeping track throughout the years to, to cut down on the ridicule factor they would hear the bigfoot stories from the field office take an official map make their own key about what had happened for the employees so um he gave he gives me the map and he, they find out that he gives an unregistered guy not affiliated with the state um that he gave me the map, they threatened to fire him over giving me that map. His son calls me up in a panic because his dad was like six months out from retiring. Um, I quickly record the map, give it back to Don and his son, and that was that. But they know, they know, they know, they know, and they don't want it out there because I think it's, let's just put it in this particular order. If they have to classify this, it's a lot bigger headache for them. They have to shut down whole sections like they did with the spotted owl. It's a control issue. It's a it's a timber issue. Um, but I think it's I think it's a power issue. Just given if they know that they know they've got all these other puzzling attributes. Um, right. So all of a sudden, that. it'll be a safety issue too. Right. All of a sudden, you know, little mm -hmm. kids are going to be in danger. It's like if we have undocumented people running around the woods, possibly abducting humans, coming onto private property, going in and out of wormholes. It's an issue. Like they're going to have to talk about it. And I think they have to get this alien thing over with first. You know, that's going to take a while. And then we're going to have to get to this Bigfoot issue down the road. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost positive, And I, I've said this before that there's a, a Bigfoot 
skeleton in some drawer in the back of the Smithsonian somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm pretty sure if Bigfoot's going to be discovered, it's going to be discovered in a drawer in a museum somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. You would be surprised. I, you know, I've spent a lot of time in this in that academic world working in museums and things like that. And there's some weird stuff in the back drawers of a lot of these little tiny museums in the middle of nowhere. Uh, for instance, little known fact, little tiny town in California up in the mountains in the Sierras called Mariposa, just outside Yosemite National Park, little tiny town. It's got a little tiny museum in it. In the back room, they have a climate controlled vault. In that vault is one of the first Gadsden flags that were ever made. Oh, wow. But nobody knows it. <laughs> you know, it's in, the, mm -hmm. it's in the back of this little tiny place in the middle of nowhere. Is that the don't tread on me flag? Yeah, they don't, tre okay. yeah, they don't tread on me flag. One okay. of the original ones, hand sewn. Wow. Uh, it, and it's mm -hmm. just crazy. And uh, I'm pretty sure there's probably a Bigfoot skeleton in the back of some museum mm -hmm. somewhere. <laughs> And real quick to Donald Fuller, who talked about where's the FOIA request. Um, you know, if the UFO stuff is, if you can't do a FOIA request on some of this UFO stuff because it goes into our nuke secrets, our Department of Energy, that's why you can't file a, a FOIA. Maybe they did this as well with what's going on here. If they're utilizing, you know, um, different means of energy to come in and out of existence and able to you know do crazy stuff at a, a moment's notice maybe it goes maybe you can't get for your requests on stuff like this it's just too sensitive if scott froze up yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right it was a long one that time okay <laughs> all right you said donald fuller is the last thing i heard <laughs> oh no! I was just talking about Donald Full Donald Fuller, Fuller mentioning FOIA requests, and you can't get a FOIA request based upon Department of Energy stuff when it pertains to nuke secrets or free energy. So maybe that's where Bigfoot belongs. Maybe that's why we don't get the information. I mean, they don't even call him Sasquatch, right? Like that's our word. That's the Native American word. Like uh, supposedly in Washington, at um, McCord. They call Sasquatch teddy bears. I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's what we had an insider that um, we vetted. And uh, he said that the 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 top br brass up there call them teddy bears. In Cottage Grove, they call them salamanders. You know, they don't call them UFOs anymore. They call them UAPs. But do they? Maybe they call UAPs like at the Pentagon. I don't know, free energy vehicles or something like that. So it's all a word game. We, do, You know what I mean? Like we're messing with total D-bags right now that like to play word games with us. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. <clears throat> all right. So by the words of the great Grover Krantz, he said if we ever got one to actually – and he was a pro kill, by the way, ever had a body of one of these things. He said you would literally have to drag it from university to university and rub people's faces in it to get you to believe it. If it come out in the newspaper, no big deal. You'd literally have to drag the body from university to university and show people. I like it. Or you could be like Rick Dyer and putting a trailer and traveling ah. around. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he tried that. <laughs> made a lot of money too yeah yes he did who's the guy that invented the spruce goose that wore the kleenex boxes howard hughes yeah howard hughes. i heard this weekend that howard hughes had an interest in the minnesota ice man have you guys ever heard that yeah uh, you have okay that's the first <laughs> time i heard that i heard yeah. he bought the actual minnesota ice man and had a replica made so the guy could There's still sell it have you guys ever heard that, that? yeah Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, they don't know the money part, but they okay. do definitely say that they had issues with taking that uh, Iceman across the border to Canada. And to do that, they had to make a duplicate. And there are some people who think that the original is in a um, refrigerated cooler in California right now. Oh, my gosh. 
I never heard about how much he, he got voted to give for it, but I heard the story about it. Yeah, I've never heard that. Donald Fluff is 50 large. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first one. The the Hank thing made over 180 grand. Hmm. That's the FU money I need. That's right. <laughs> We need to make a general announcement to any mama or daddy Warbucks that <laughs> yeah. wants to support. Let me let me send a quick text to to uh, Rick Blair for you, dear Scott. Right. See if he can throw you a bone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I was just glancing through the chat real quick. Um. So uh, we're getting close to the end here. I got one last question. What do you believe is the most promising avenue for future research on Bigfoot? Hmm. Hmm. I would say um, getting in close, if you can, if you can gain their trust, getting in good with people that live with the phenomena, these Sasquatch contactees or extended experiencers that are like the Autumn Williams, Sally Shepard, Walford, types that live remote like they did in Oregon, Washington, that, that have it going on. Um, you have to get their trust first, and then you lock it in. You have a confined five acres or whatever it is. Um, you Jane good all the hell out of it. And, um, you know, don't try to trick them. Um, use, use audio more than video, as, as frustrating as that is. Ask for photographs. Don't think you'll ever get one. And um, lean in on the audio portion of it and just keep an open mind with this being a type of people with puzzling attributes. That's, I think that's how we get to the bottom of this. And it will probably happen with a woman because in the primate world, that's where it happened. The guys couldn't do it as well as the women's. The women could, you know, Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall. Mm -hmm. And I think it just has something to do with the patients. It probably has something to do with the nurturing quality. Um, I just think that guys, it's tougher for us because we want that, that adrenaline evidence, right? Mm -hmm. And the women don't need it. Do you see what, uh, finding track what has to say up there? Uh, uh, which one? It says that there's a story of some rich family in New York that owns a nature preserve having a captured Bigfoot released into the wild. I like it. I've never heard of that. Never yeah. heard there from there. Wow. Never heard from That's there. <laughs> so I don't know. What do you I, I think um it's really gonna take a lot of money. It's gonna take that money. To get somebody who is a, a credible scientist to walk away from a tenure, to walk away from anything that's being held over his head, you know, to get that, you know, that type of knowledge, education, uh, a, a researcher who really knows how to research scientifically, meaning they know how to keep log books, know how to collect evidence, have connections to get that evidence, um, or even have their own lab. It's going to take that whole package. Mm -hmm. And for somebody to be out there more than a weekend, more than, you know, it, it's going to take a very long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there's so something that yeah, there's something that Jeff Meldrum told me a, a couple of weeks ago. Where I was talking with him, and uh, he said he's well past retirement age. And and I said, well, why don't you retire and go hunt Bigfoot? You know, and he goes, if I retire, I lose my lab. So <laughs> if if and while he's working there, he's probably under constraints. So there we go. It's a two-edged sword right there. Wow. But, um, well, what I think 
I think that environmental DNA could be helped, but we need the DNA from Bigfoot first. Uh, that's kind of the route I'm shooting for um, right now. Uh, we have, uh, which is going to be a virtual impossibility. I know, I know I'm like grasping at straws here, but uh, I have one of those tranquilizer dart guns. <laughs> But uh, we don't have tranks for it because I'm not a vet and I don't know how much to do, you know. But we have DNA darts that will hit a Bigfoot, draw blood and fall off. And they have trackers in them so we can find them. But um, my my idea was to maybe dart one of these things on camera with a GoPro on my gun so you can see the dart hitting Bigfoot and getting the DNA that way. But then of course we got to fight the fight about oh it's contaminated oh you you know it's not wasn't a real bigfoot or you know so there's all this stuff not sure <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. so what do you think joe well what your idea was pretty good but you gotta get close enough to shoot one yeah that's which is going to be a virtual impossibility <laughs> yeah so that's a, yeah, that's a good idea. But like I say, if you're not close enough, you know, I don't know how far well it's dark or accurate. Probably not mm -hmm. more than 25, 30 yards, maybe, I guess. Yeah, that's about 30 yards, yep. There's a lot of people out there that so they've been closer than that, though. But by the time you draw your gun up, you know, it's good unless you're sitting there walking around like that. Mm. And then I think I if a big person sees you walk around like that, <laughs> well, you have a gun, and he's not going to show himself. Yeah, exactly. Know? Yep. And somebody said a drone with a trank. Now, here's Thank another you. problem. We were talking about the government stuff. Uh, modern drones have GPSs in them, and they won't fly in national forests. Oh. So if you're in a national forest, they literally won't fly, and they won't fly within five miles of an airport either, But uh, because that's just... FAA rules, but uh, the National Forest is illegal to fly drones in. So there's that. I found that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they don't work at sororities either, Joe. So <laughs> yeah. <you're not> gonna... <laughs> yeah. I found a picture of uh, people don't know this, but I'm a forensic artist, a lot like Harvey Pratt. So I do a uh, realistic witness. This is a picture of a uh, Squatch and Cowboy catching a cloaked Sasquatch. This is how oh, we do it. <laughs> there you go. I'll no, first sign it. Off, first off, <laughs> if I was a roper, I'd be a healer, which means rapper. I got the I got the bow legs here too, Squatch and Cowboy. That guy looks like the guy from Curious George, the <laughs> guy with the yellow hat. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I guess I'm getting famous. Man, people are drawing cartoons about me. That's right, baby. <laughs> That's good, though. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> I never thought about that. Damn, I don't know if I could drag them down, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Wonder Woman rope, so you can get right. even the cloaked Sasquatch, yeah. That's it. There we go. <laughs> well, thank you, guys. Any last thoughts mm. before we go? Well, for people that want to meet Scott and Hannah, um, <laughs> they have they have a way to do it. People don't know this, but Scott and Hannah um, are among the 27 or so people that are going to join us and Dr. Simeon Hine, the cast and crew of Flash of Beauty, and um, Rich Germo in particular, and the director and DP and myself. And we're going to dig into all these stranger issues in the Pacific Northwest on the last weekend of September. So it's sold out, but we're going to hide two tickets on the Olympic Peninsula. So if you want to meet Scott and Hannah, um, we have a scavenger hunt that's going to start. And every week we're going to have a clue over at a Flash of Beauty YouTube channel when we do a live event, Jill and I. So each week... Um, I'll release a clue and by the summer you'll have a chance to add up all the clues 
and go out and join us in the woods with uh, a golden ticket for two. So <laughs> stay fine. tuned for that. Joe, you got any adventures coming up? No, I got to say that uh, the past video I did about the 11 year old uh, had a Bigfoot encounter. It's possibly my last video because I just, it's just getting where I can't afford to go out and do it anymore. Oh, mm. sorry. But I'll be here. <laughs> okay, awesome. Unless I, can, unless I can start walking the roads and picking up aluminum cans and going selling them. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's it for me. I mean, that's. I'll be here every second Wednesday of the month. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Unless a Bigfoot comes around my property somewhere, but you never know. <laughs> yeah. I've just neglected my house and my land and stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff around here I got to do. I got to get my truck fixed and stuff like yeah. that. So the money I spend on going out, I'm going to put in all this stuff and get everything back together. Totally understand. Yeah. Cool. All right, Nick, you got anything coming up? Uh no, just the same old stuff. Uh researching for my shows. And there is a slot canyon that's about 50 minutes away from me that I wanna go explore. It's not a Bigfoot thing, just uh just a hiking loop, but uh looks pretty awesome, you know, <laughs> to spectacular shots what's up where's that right outside of las cruces oh up there okay mm -hmm. right outside of there and uh, it's just a short loop i think it's a uh, 1.2 mile 1.4 mile loop uh through a little slot canyon so i'm going to try to do that i think i'm going to try to go on saturday i'm not sure if i'd be able to live stream that but but we'll see. I won't know till I get there. Cool. Well, if you want to know where we're going to be, uh, squatchamerica.com. You can look at us, look us up. We got a whole bunch of festivals we're going to be doing this summer. And then this fall, uh, we're going to go spend a lot of time down in the Cloudcroft, New Mexico area. Maybe I'll go hang out with Nikki. <laughs> It's not too far from. Yeah, the last time you were there was during the holidays, so yeah. I had all kinds of people here and stuff. So yeah, no, definitely, I'm gonna get up there. All right, so yeah, we're gonna go hang out there and 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 look for that uh, fu money. Okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so, it's a, I want to find it first. <laughs> yeah. Right. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, Everybody, in chat. everybody in the chat thank you for hanging out with us and until next time bye <laughs> oh we got to do the the ending thing here <laughs> i gotta find the right buttons